Friday afternoon, folks, downtown Honolulu. Ted Rawson here with our show, Where the Drone Leads. We have a fantastic guest on for you today. We have Mr. Dustin Helwig. Dustin, thanks for coming on. Hi, Ted. Thanks for having me. It was, uh, it's going to be quite a conversation. And sitting in the background here is Jim Gilmore, in case we need a reinforcement, right? Mr. Gerard, okay. yes. Mr. Gerard. Okay, right. Not Gilmore, Gerard. That's okay. Right. And you are the Chief Technology Officer of uh, Chesapeake Technology. Technology International. Yes, sir. Tell yeah, us we, about CTI. We started the company uh, almost 17 years ago, back in 2000, uh, April 1st, actually, which April Fool's Day, it kind of makes <laughs> sense. So 17 years in business. We uh, were founded down in southern Maryland near uh, Patuxent Naval Air Station, and uh, now we've kind of spread across the country, and uh, we support some unique niche DOD and intelligence community customers um, and have uh, some various commercial uh, endeavors as well. Yeah, that's great. And of course, that discussion you just went through sounds like something that came up at the recently conducted uh, PACOM Science and Technology Conference, where yes. we had a lot of interaction. Yes, exactly. And uh, second year in a row, I think we've had that kind of interaction. We had uh, Dr. Song Choi from UH on last week, setting us up for the oncoming event of this week, and then great. we had the event this week. You know, I thought it was one of the better post-conferences. We had more discussion, more dialogue, more different kinds of people coming through. Yeah, I felt it was excellent. It was really good to hear the perspectives of the uh, enlisted panel, you know, the real <laughs> operators that have to use the stuff that we build and understand, you know, it, what doesn't work. Sometimes it's a simple thing that, hey, this button is hard to use. Uh, you know, we're trying to solve hard technology problems, and sometimes it's more simple than we, than we want to make it. You know, that takes me back to about six years ago when one of the enlisted panels had the Marines talking about how many different batteries they have to carry and they have to change them all at 11.55 at night or something. So they were carrying like five pounds of batteries, all different types for all the stuff we design and develop and, and, and have them take. Exactly. So, uh, Unfortunately, I guess, uh, most of what we do is software development, which doesn't weigh very much. So Marines And that's a really interesting <laughs> subject. Software development, spectrum management, and all that, that, that sinew that ties together systems, ties together units, ties together people, ties together... Uh, governments and such. That's what you are dealing in. Yeah, there's, a, management. there's an emerging um, philosophy, uh, and it hasn't been approved yet in DOD, but of making spectrum a, an operational domain. So today you have air, land, sea, space. They want to make spectrum a new operational domain. And, and the key to that is understanding what, what spectrum is and being able to see it and uh, figure out how to operate in it. So somebody can look through a telescope and see land, how do we look at spectrum and operate in it? That's really interesting. Spectrum is a really abstract term for most people, so we have to break that down and carefully explain what spectrum means. But I just thought of something kind of on the humorous side as you say that. We have the J6s, we have the J3s, and the J2s. There's always contention between them. Yes. Now if we have another spectrum domain, are we going to have a... 6.5 or something like that that manages Spectrum? Well, and there actually is. So today okay. the J6 does own Spectrum and the 6.5 shop is the Spectrum management community. Uh, and it is a challenge getting the operational community in the three, the intelligence community in the two, and the Spectrum and cyber community in the six to communicate and collaborate in this operational domain. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's kind of like if my air traffic control radars weren't talking to my air traffic controllers, planes would fly into each other, but we do that in Spectrum all the time. And so that's, again, one of these hidden abstract things is under the surface. It's dominant and prevalent everywhere. It makes things work. It makes radios communicate. It makes systems and units and people interact, but we don't see it. Yeah, people like their cell phones, and it all yeah. operates on Spectrum. And Spectrum is vulnerable. Uh, you know, it's easily uh, denied, so we can interfere with Spectrum use, and that's really the, the s focus of the electronic warfare domain, which we do a lot of work in as well. And, you know, the thing that's interesting is as much as we talk about defense things at, at the Pacific Command and the S&T conference this week, we also have the humanitarian, humanitarian response and disaster operations side, which is going to be just as necessarily uh, attendant to the whole spectrum issue. Absolutely. In fact, we participated in an experiment yeah. called Pacific Endeavor. Uh, its focus was uh, communications interoperability when a disaster happens. So a uh, tsunami happens in the Philippines, you have uh, OGAs and uh, you know, third parties and other countries coming to respond, and they all start using their radios, which are incompatible, and they can start conflicting with each other. And then even worse, if you have a, a, a bad actor, if you will, in that environment that's trying to in intentionally interfere with the use of those systems for whatever reason. Yeah, so spectrum applied to the humanitarian mission of the military and also 
it always flows down to the civil side. The, mm -hmm. the civil environment is getting very complicated with the infrastructures and the complicated situations we have, totally dependent on the Internet and other forms of communication. Once again, Spectrum drives all of that. Yeah, I mean, if you think in a mobile environment where you're in your car <laughs> or in a tank, you don't access the Internet without Spectrum. Uh, and so the tools that we're developing, we're trying to figure out how to help people see and understand spectrum and operate in that arena, whether it's uh, changing frequency to avoid interference or physically maneuvering to get to an area where they will likely have a better signal. And then even putting that capability into autonomous systems like drones uh, so that they can be more successful when spectrum is cluttered. Uh, thank you for saying drones, because this show is called of Where course. the Drone Leads, and as you read on, on, the, on the teleprompter there, it says you have to say drones at least once during the show. Okay, so well, Dustin, one check. <laughs> man, you got that one right. <laughs> thank that's, you. That's totally cool. But, but that is, on a serious nature, a uh, serious note, the whole world of drones has to pay attention to the spectrum issue in a big way. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, whether you're doing sense and avoid technology to keep drones or aircraft <laughs> from running into each other, or whether it's the data link that's the control link to that uh, UAV, or the communications links between UAVs when you're trying to create the swarm uh, or have UAVs uh, cooperate, um, you have to take that into account. Amen. And then you have to have the quality of that service into account as well, because there's going to be, if there's interruptions and, and the disruptions in the, in the signal, the, sometimes the automatic flight control systems will disconnect or will return to home or take some protective action if there's a quality loss in the signal. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and sometimes we want to cause that to happen, <laughs> uh, especially yeah, right. if somebody's flying a drone over the White House, for example. Uh, but certainly we want to preserve it for our own so that they continue to operate even when they're being interfered with. But what, you know, what also, and we talked about this at the show as well as even before this show, uh, what's intriguing to me is that Spectrum management, spectrum modeling, spectrum testing, all these things are something that Hawaii could play a big role in. Certainly. And we're trying to move uh, spectrum managers into spectrum operators so that we have mm -hmm. a sense of being in the fight instead of just being managers before the fight. But to that end, um, I, I, we're, we're communicating with the University of Hawaii, Dr. Iskander, I think I pronounced that right, uh, who is focused on RF propagation modeling algorithms. And uh, we'd like to combine some of the technologies we've developed uh, where maybe we can map uh, the 3D structure of an urban area and then feed that into an RF propagation algorithm so that I can understand how the signals will propagate through the urban canyon and then using that to autonomously uh, provide that quality of service for drones that might be flying through those uh, concrete jungles. So there would be yeah. some system underlying the, uh, the dashboard, so to speak, where that calculation is going on full time and, and uh, frequencies, uh, waveforms, uh, 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 connection systems would be being automatically determined that are most optimum for that communication, for that vehicle, that person, that drone, whatever it might be, with some destination he's trying to talk to. Exactly. So have an ongoing, kind of like a, the way animals work, the way people work, finding yeah. the optimum path. Yeah, we kind of, uh, we've related it to bats before. Ah, if if okay. you look at how bats echo, geolocate, and, you know, avoid, the, vo avoid each other and find bugs, so that, you know, because they're trying to eat, of course. Uh, drones don't need to eat, but they want to survive and not crash into buildings. So uh, we also have auto routing algorithms that you could potentially run in the drone itself that would enable it to physically maneuver to attain that quality of service. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting. What you're suggesting is the drone can maneuver and manipulate in order to improve the quality of service of its own communication. Exactly. And that would also lead to the mission being done by the drone because the, uh, that, you could, that is you could manage the, uh, the return from the target or whatever it might be that you're looking at or yeah. the quality of the signal or the determination of the volcanic smoke, whatever it might be, you could optimize on that. Absolutely. And that, that's one of the challenges. A lot of people are focusing on uh, optimizing swarm movement. So how do I make UAVs that are trying to work together move coherently? What we're focusing on is how do I make them perform some function coherently or together? Uh, so someone else is working the problem of how do I make the swarms fly? We're working on the problem of how do I make the swarm do something useful? So how do you optimize on the mission? Mm, and exactly. that, that leads to mission self-determination on board or re redirecting of the mission or adjusting as members of the, of the fleet fall out and run out of fuel or simply aren't available to us. Yes, it has to be dynamic. I mean, yeah. today we do pre-mission planning that, uh, you know, is inflexible in mission, uh, but we need to make it more flexible and dynamic based on real-time What conditions. we have in, in that sense is uh, we have basically a open-loop scheduling is how we operate today as opposed to closed-loop optimization. Absolutely. Yeah. This, is, this conversation is great because I'll tell you that uh, Dr. Uh, Delmarat Asimov is probably not watching. He's not running a proposal right now, writing one, but uh, we've got some 
R&D going into NSF, it's past its phase one, that is dealing with the, the way the command and control system, the TGNC, targeting, guidance, navigation, control, mm -hmm. should work in order to match the kind of mission operations you're talking about. Because the sensor set coming in is, is, is maybe unstructured and unpredictable. You could have losses in the sensors. You could have yes. sensors that you, didn't, that you didn't plan for. So unstructured sensor uh, collection, common filtering and such to take out the, the bogus signals and get just the, the fact, and then turning that into a command and control system with enough precision to complete the mission or to go to a safe spot if you can't complete the mission. Absolutely, that's and an interesting part of that is you have to do it in a way that's performant enough to run <laughs> within these very small, potentially small drones. So, you know, like we were talking earlier, spectrum can be easily denied. I may not have persistent command and control with that swarm. So I have to put enough autonomy in the swarm or in the drones themselves so that uh, they can make those kinds of decisions on their own without having to go back to a high performance platform. Amen. So you have a persistence issue of some kind that has to be addressed here. And the persistence could be, you could imagine it to be uh, assume whatever you want, a one minute drop in service or a loss in quality of service, a five minute, ten minute, whatever it might be, and the more you have to think of quality of service under that denied ac uh, asset, it's going to be a more complicated solution. Yeah, we actually have a new um, small business innovative research program with uh, Special Operations Command to focus on exactly that problem. How do I make a disadvantaged, intermittent, low bandwidth, DIL they call it, uh, sensor synchronized to and from a cloud environment so that I can get data in and out of the enterprise. In my day in the business, DIL stood for disconnected, intermittent, and limited regarding communication. <laughs> so well, you're, that's interesting. So since I have It's also pickle. What's that? It's also pickle. <laughs> right. yeah. But uh, well, pickle meant pull the handle and the bomb goes off. So yes. uh, uh, the uh, DIL, tell me again what DIL means in this in today's interpretation. Uh, disadvantaged, intermittent, and low bandwidth. So very constrained wait, wait, communication. Wait, disadvantaged. Disadvantaged. Okay. Intermittent. Intermittent and low bandwidth. That's interesting because it used to be uh, disconnected, intermittent, and limited. So it's been up. Acronyms Even DIL has been upgraded up. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go to some military spec and look at the three pages of acronyms that are yeah. in the front three, <laughs> the frontis in the front part, and relearn what all the acronyms are because they've moved since I last saw them. Yeah. It, the worst part is when they put acronyms in acronyms. Uh, yeah, yeah. No kidding. Right. Yeah. It yeah. does happen. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, back to the, the nature of our discussion. Uh, this, this form of optimization in a complex dynamic environment, which you may not have precise knowledge of, this almost comes back to simulation being a big part here in some way. Yeah, I think to tune or train the algorithms up front to make sure that they're going to behave in a manner that is uh, not necessarily predictable, but is not dangerous, of course. Uh, M&S becomes very important modeling and simulation because we, we have to run those algorithms in a more controlled environment where we can vary all the parameters. Uh, and, and we have to have a visualization environment that allows us to see that in both the model, modeled environment uh, because humans don't like to trust numbers on a spreadsheet. They like to see things. This is fascinating because you have to have a broad so plateau type solution rather than a peak solution and it has to be damage tolerant or issue tolerant so that it can keep functioning even under degraded inputs. Yeah, we've actually yeah. looked at, there's a technology that Netflix developed called Chaos Monkey. Netflix. It's an open source project. Yeah. Netflix, you go to the commercial side where the people have to, sure. if they don't get movies that come through, you're not gonna make money. Exactly. Let's pick that whole issue up after our first break here, the we'll whole do. issue of reliability and resilience in the system. I like that. Thanks. Aloha! This is Gordo the Tech Star here at Hibachi Talk. I want to thank you guys for joining us every week from uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon to 1.30 Hawaii time where we talk about tech. But this year we're kind of branching out and we're talking about all other interesting kinds of facts and figures. And uh, Andrew, my security guy, will, will be joining us as he always is, um, giving us a uh, weekly security tip. And we will also then have Angus giving us some gadgets and some things that's really starting to irritate his okole. So we're going to have him coming out as well. Anyway, Drew, do you have anything you want to say? Glad to be here, man. Happy to help. <laughs> there we go. Thanks again. Hibachi talk. We'll see you soon. Aloha, Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options. And we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Friday afternoon, folks. Second part of our show, Where the Drone Leads. Ted Ralston here in our downtown Honolulu studios, uh, Think Tech. 
And with me is Dustin Helwig. Dustin, again, thanks for coming on board. First thanks, time. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for having me. You know, the way this show works, once you come on once, you got to come on again. Uh-oh. I we, guess I'm bound in now. We can trap you by Skype. And, we can, and you can send Jim in if you want. And if you, if I'll have to do that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, Dustin and Jim, who's sitting behind the scenes here telling Dustin what to say, are uh, from uh, uh, Chesapeake Technology International. And you're actually in uh, the East Coast. Yeah, so our headquarters is near Pax River Naval Air Station. Okay. We have an office near Dulles, one in Denver, and two in California. Okay, so you're a virtual operation. And then yeah. you're, of course, a couple of you are out here in Hawaii right now. Yeah, we're out here visiting. Uh, you know, we'd really like to look at setting up a persistent presence on island let's, here. Wait, wait, wait. Let's catch that. Can you say that again? We'd really like to look at setting up a persistent presence okay, on so island here. Okay, so persistence has two terms. It has not yes. only the QoS, it also has, let's be a business that's persistent and has a, has a continuity of purpose and continuity of operation. Exactly. And to that end, we, we uh, last year we sponsored a STEM scholarship with the University of Hawaii. Did you? Yes. Right. And uh, we'd like to, you know, build on that relationship so that we can find a recruiting presence here uh, to at least find the, you know, top engineers that might be interested in our field here. Uh, maybe even do some seminars at the university so that we can help uh, electrical engineers, software developers, and RF engineers at the university understand what it is that we do in electronic warfare and spectrum. And after that, Fascinating conversation we had in the first part of the show. I wanted to take what you just said one step further. The interesting thing to me about Spectrum is that it doesn't require a big aerospace factory nearby where you make spars and ribs and wings and fuselages in order to have an aerospace presence. And uh, so Hawaii doesn't have that large manufacturing capability. We have no natural resources. We have sunshine and fresh water or salt water. But uh, uh, so Hawaii taking on spectrum management, spectrum operations, spectrum futures, mm -hmm. uh, modeling and simulation, uh, uh, quantum computing, and that influ what influence that's going to have on spectrum. Mm -hmm. All these things could be done here. Yeah, and there are uh, natural resources you do have, I think, that are eminently lever leverageable. One is humans with brains and intelligence. Uh, another is you have some very good range facilities here that have very broad spectrum clearance. Uh, it's very hard sometimes on the continental U.S. Yeah. to do spectrum-related testing and evaluation because we interfere with, uh, you know, nearby cities and people's cell phones, and they don't like that very much. Okay, so we have that. And the other thing we have is a, a probably unique to the United States, a really tight connection between the Pacific Command, which is our warfight joint command, mm -hmm. our National Guard, and our state and local uh, and federal uh, law enforcement and public safety agencies. In fact, the National Guard has officers on duty in PACOM leadership, mm -hmm. and PACOM has officers over in National Guard. So the two are, everybody's tied together, and we're all trying to solve problems. And the, I think the model people have here is that, hey, we aren't connected to someplace else. You can't drive from here to Nebraska or something like that. So everybody, the problems have to be solved here. Yes. And so there's a, uh, a, a problem-solving attitude, and there's also quite an interesting uh, homogenation of cultural thought, which I think is something we haven't even talked about yet, but language and, and perception have an influence on how you solve problems. Yes. So we have all the right pieces. We have the leadership, the thought leadership in you and, and your peers and folks at the university to put something together that could become part of the industry structure here. Yeah, you also have very broad international engagement out here, and Spectrum is interesting in that it crosses boundaries. You know, electrons don't just stop <laughs> because of a country's boundary. So we unintentionally cause interference all the time with others. Um, uh, and so that, that international presence here is useful as well because you can engage with other countries and build plans for, you know, how to mitigate that, especially in HADR types of environments. And with, you know, with the PACOM structure, I think the Pacific Command has about the largest geographical responsibility in all the, all the country. And uh, we hit more countries through the Pacific Command than any other of the joint commands. And yet, the, it's persistence and quality of life and those things that really matter at the end of the day. So we yeah. can tie those into spectrum, actually. As a matter of fact, they do tie into spectrum. Absolutely. We should think about that in the context of the sea level rise and the global warming going on, because populations are affected on the Western Pacific Islands that are going to have to change what they do, because their lands are gone. Yeah. And, uh, so that puts stresses on populations, and that leads to the kind of issues that require a lot of communication and reliable communication in order to get through. Yeah, and from, from uh, the work our company does, uh, all you need is a good computer and a smart person, and you can write software. 
Uh, so, you know, it's a potential uh, career path for people that are in remote locations like this. Uh, plus, because of the unique time zone nature of Pacific Command, it's useful to have people local. And that's also true in the sense of business. We're kind of in between the east and the west in terms of the business time cycle, so you can catch them both in the same uh, shorter period of time Absolutely. in the day. So how do we, how do we if, you had, if you had a checkbook that was unlimited and you could write the script of the world, how would you create a, this kind of a, a rich spectrum-based business in Hawaii? Well, if I had an unlimited checkbook, I probably wouldn't be here today, Ted. Okay, so the, I'm glad you don't have unlimited. We just saw that. So, uh, Jim, can you fix that problem? He hasn't got an unlimited checkbook. I'm working on it. Okay, he's going to work on that problem. So, um, I, you know, I think the STEM scholarship's a good start. We've got to get interest generated in our field and our domain with the young engineers and the faculty at the university and, and build up a knowledge base that can be applied. Um, I think some of the uh, national intelligence presences here are helping with that as well because they, they work in similar boundaries, whether you're sensing spectrum or using it to communicate or doing other things. You know, there's parallel paths there. Um, I also think that, um, you know, it broadening the STEM programs with uh, organizations like AFSIA, which is the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association, uh, with um, NDIA, who sponsored the post conference this week, and with uh, AOC, the Association of Old Crows, which is the Electronic Warfare Organization. Uh, you know, expanding those programs would be helpful as well. Okay, and then uh, the other thing that I goes through my mind all the time: STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, is a sort of a subject. The object is quality of life or sustainability, resilience, something like that. So the more we can tie together that subject and the, the result it generates mm -hmm. and validate or verify or uh, show how spectrum management is the thing that's going to tie it together. Yeah, that, I mean, our domain is... abstracted to a certain extent. Exactly. Our, our domain is highly technical. You know, it's, uh, you know, even though we hire predominantly uh, software engineers, it really helps if they have a physics background, a double E background, a mathematics background, uh, because a lot of what we do is heavily algorithmic. Uh, and it also helps if they're excited about it. So we like to hire former operators and people that, you know, use and, and, and attack spectrum for a living and help them uh, get our engineers excited about what they do. Uh, one nice thing about what we do, um, you know, so many people always want to go for the kinetic response in warfare, you know, shoot a gun or shoot a missile or do. Uh, with Spectrum, you can have deliberate effects uh, that are quite extensive without firing a, a, a physical shot. So people don't generally die, um, and you can, uh, you know, really have a prohibitive effect uh, without launching a missile. And that's also actually also transfers well to the business community. Business community doesn't shoot people or kill people, it promotes people and it promotes health and it promotes life and it promotes quality and it promotes education. And the same basic concepts apply in that environment as they do in the combat environment. There's a tie there. You know, the other thing I was going to take you back to is uh, these complex systems as they interact, uh, quality of service, uh, handling faults and this sort of thing or unknowns that might occur. Mm -hmm. Two thoughts come into the picture. Some of the advanced math, like uh, 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 neural nets that, or well, that, that artificial certainly. intelligence. Yeah, those those general subjects. But I'm thinking of uh, uh, the chain modeling. Uh, if I could, if I, when I get younger, I'll be able That's to come okay. up with the name of the Russian name. It happens name. to the it, best uh, of us. Uh, anyway, the chain modeling looks at how chains affect each other, how a hmm. problem creates, starts, and either it expands and becomes catastrophic, or you collapse it by controlling it and uh, Markov chain modeling. Oh, okay, okay. There's there you a, go. There's a whole yeah. branch of mathematics that needs to start getting uh, the drums beating real hard on in order to understand these things and be able to manipulate and, and, and uh, design these areas. The other side that comes into the picture is linguistics. And uh, uh, language is kind of the mechanism by how we think. And things have value or low, higher or low value depending on adjectives and adverbs and things like that and verbs and nouns all have different ways in constructing our thoughts. The sooner we can get our spectrum management to think that way and to have that as a, a framework for how it operates, uh, the better we're going to be. There is a branch called uh, 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 linguistic geometry hmm. that is somewhat useful in and I'd love to introduce you to the guys. Word networks. Uh, you have somebody in Colorado, right? Oh, yeah, myself. And what, what city in Colorado? Uh, I live in Colorado Springs. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, uh, not far from you in, at, at the University of Colorado mm -hmm. is uh, the, the, the Stillman Brothers, and they operate Stillman Advanced Technologies. Mm. And they are these guys who are behind the linguistic geometry 
domain. I think you and they would, would need to I get, love good introductions. To get together. Always so it to totally talk it's to yeah. It's abstracting things, but it takes it to a very practical level. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about counter drone, whether you're doing it for a facility protection or for some other means. Um, I, I think uh, more advances need to be done in figuring out ways to control them in an urban environment, especially where they won't cause damage potentially or uh, interfere with human activities uh, while keeping things protected. Oh, um, amen. That, yeah. that, then that's uh, sort of the, the, the track, identify track and, and detect aspect, or maybe right. detect uh, and identify aspect of counter drone as opposed to the kinetic takedown or the command or the uh, command takeover and this sort of thing. But there's absolutely no question that we're going to have to do that. We have license plates on cars so we can identify who they are. We have roads they go on so they don't go where the roads aren't. We don't have any of that to manage drones. We're supposed right. to register them. I expect that 90% of the people don't. Yeah. And we're supposed and, to respect And they use these generally commercial uh, RF links that are very similar to each other. They don't have a unique signature that's easy to exploit necessarily. Right. And in fact, uh, some of them can't even carry the bandwidth. A lot of video down is going to swamp the system, and so yeah. we're not going to get there. But if, if you're a Hollywood production and you're making a movie out here in Hawaii and using a drone, you sure don't want some other drone snooping on top of that and yeah. sticking your m movie out on the internet that night. Exactly. And if you're Punahou School, you don't want to have Iolani come over and observe your football practice. Yeah. So very, very easy to understand uh, models as to how we have to understand what's there. But if you're the power company, our power company uses drones to manage the power grid. Uh, if they have six, we'll say, and they're operating with six, and two more show up that they don't know where they came from. Yeah. How come there's two more? What's going on here? Well, I think an but, important part of that is situational understanding. So having, A, the sensors to identify and track and all that, but B, having that visual representation so that humans can monitor yeah. and see it. And, and we certainly work in that area as well. So three-dimensional common operating picture driven by spectrum. Exactly. Spectrum, Thank you. that's unreal. Well said. And, you know, our, our show used to be 45 minutes. We had to make it half hour. We are, at this point, uh, extremely excited in our discussion, but we are running into the time okay. limit. So well, I really appreciate you having me hey on. Hey, man, this is cool. We ought to get some business going here and some work with the university, work with the, with the civil agencies, and PACOM. Let's do it. Thanks, Ted. Dustin Helwig from uh, Tissapeak Technology International, thanks so much for coming on. And thanks for doing a good job, Jim, keeping us on, on track here.